Okay, thank you for reminding me. Okay, and um, let's go ahead and put in slideshow and current. Okay, and uh, what we have is this notion of major funds. Okay, so what happens? The analogous would be to if you've studied segment reporting in financial accounting, we talk about the notion that a company management needs to disclose information about their various segments if they meet certain size tests. And in commercial, the rule is that if a segment constitutes 10% of revenue, 10% of profit or loss on an absolute value basis, 10% of assets, that segment is constituted to be large enough and that the company is going to have to disclose information about their uh, major segments. Well, what GASB did was something similar for governments. And the reason they did this is they said, well, look, we are talking about the different fund types. There's only one general fund, but we have the special revenue fund, the service fund, capital project fund. We have our enterprise permanent fund, our enterprise funds that make up our um, that make up our business type activity column on our consolidated statements. And then we show all that fund related data, but an entity could have, a government could have hundreds of funds. I mean, it's not like there's only a finite number of funds. They could have, they'll have one general fund, but they could have special, several special revenue funds. So what are we gonna make them put on the face of their governmental fund financial statements, columns calling out the funds? We're going to only make them call out the major funds on the face of the governmental uh, financial statements. And so um, they came up with two size tests and the size test in order to be considered a major fund, the fund has to constitute 10% of, and it's basically all the lines items on the financial statements, assets, liabilities, revenues, expenses, the only item that isn't considered and, and may determine if you have a major fund is fund balance. Okay, Fund balance is a line item on the balance sheet, but we're not going to use that as part of our test. So in order for a fund to be a major fund, it has to constitute 10% of the related governmental funds. If you're looking at a governmental fund, if you're looking at an enterprise fund, it has to constitute 10% of the related enterprise funds. And then you're going to take your governmental funds and your enterprise funds together. And the second test to determine if you have a major fund is it has to constitute 5% of the combination of both your governmental and your enterprise funds. And if a fund meets both of those tests, then it is considered a major fund. Now you listen to that and you go, what did he say? Okay, so I think it's easier to understand if you look at this example, which is a little bit hard to see on the screen. Let's see if I can improve that situation a little bit. Yeah, okay, that doesn't look too bad, okay. And so what they've done here is they've given us an example, and this comes from the McGraw-Hill textbook that you didn't get, okay, but that's all right. I'm gonna show it to you here anyway. And we have these different governmental funds and they're trying to determine if these funds should be considered major funds and therefore be reported on the face of the uh, governmental uh, balance sheet and, and um, the governmental statement of revenues, expenditures and changes in fund balance. And so you start to look at this and you take it a fund at a time and you have these two, and it's not gonna let me draw on it now because I um, because I, uh, I don't think it will. Yeah, it doesn't let me draw on it if I increase the size. But you have this, I can do it with my cursor here, but you have what? You have the 10% of the total governmental funds. Now, you can't see the base that they use to calculate this 10%. That's one problem with this example. They don't give you the base that they use to calculate this 10%, but they're telling you that when you took all the governmental funds, added them together and multiplied that number by 10%, you came up with 4,492,627 for assets, 
86,792 for liabilities and so on. They're not showing you the calculation that generated the numbers in this column. They're not showing you the calculation that generated the numbers in this 5% column. For the 5% column, they contemplated having taken all of the governmental funds and all of the enterprise funds, added all those together, assets, liabilities, revenues, expenditures, expenses, doing them one line item at a time, multiplying that now combined number for the governmental enterprise funds by 5%, and they have their 5% threshold. So they got a 10% threshold, 5% threshold. In order to be considered a major fund, a fund has to meet both of these tests, both the 5% test and the 10% test. So once you have these numbers, then it's just a matter of going through and analyzing these three funds here one by one. So you start with the road fund and you look at what assets in the road fund. And when you compare this 1,369,238 to the 10% number 4,492,627 for assets, is the road fund passing that first test, yes or no? No. no, no, it is not. So it is not a major fund based on assets, but hang on, we're not done yet. Now we go to liabilities. And when you look at the liabilities, you have this 172,439 for the road fund. Hey, it's meeting what? It's meeting the 10% test, but now you have to go to what? The 5% test does not meet the 5% test. This is not a major fund based on liability. So now I go to revenue. And when I look at the road fund, I have revenues of 4,289,876. I compare that to the 10% for revenue. Didn't meet the revenue test. This is its last shot now. I look at expenditures, 3,986. And when I look at the 10% column, it fails that test too. So what happens? The road fund is not a major fund because it what it didn't pass any of the tests, and you can see that highlighted again. It's kind of hard for me to point to when I'm in this mode, but you see that in green. Road fund is not a major fund. Now I go to the debt service fund. Debt service fund. It's not making it on assets. Three eight nine two four nine two. Nope, not making it on assets. Liabilities. Nope, not making it on liabilities. Let's see revenues. Okay, it's passing the what the ten percent test on revenues, and it's passing what it's passing the five percent test on revenues. Therefore, the debt service fund is a major fund. I don't need to ask it anymore. I don't need to go down to the expenditures. It only has to meet this for one of these. And then I finally come down to the capital project fund. Capital project fund, big time is meeting the asset test for both cases. It is a major fund. So the debt service fund, capital project fund here are major funds. I will report them on the face of the uh, governmental fund financial statements. Road tax fund, I will not report on the face of those statements. Question? Uh, yeah, where is the, uh, how is this, uh, like, 4,492,000, 4, this 10% threshold being calculated? Is it 10% of the assets for road fund, debt service, and capital projects? No, it's all governmental funds. Oh, okay, gotcha. Yeah, all governmental funds. I add them all together. They didn't show that part of the calculation. I add Got them it, all okay. together, I multiply by 10%. I take all my enterprise funds and my governmental funds, add them together, multiply that by 5% for each one of these line items. And that's what generates the numbers in those two columns that we were using as our threshold. Got it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Now, the question that uh, may be burning now is, well, once I've decided what my major funds are, what do I do with the non-major funds, throw them in the garbage. No, you roll them all up into a column that will say other governmental funds. So again, this is my um, governmental fund balance sheet, right? And I called out 
the major funds, these guys are major funds. It, it doesn't relate to that last example, but these guys, general fund is, by the way, is always a major fund. General fund is always considered a major fund, okay? And it's, it's almost for sure gonna meet the two test anyway, but if it some weird reason it doesn't, GASB tells us, well, it's still a, a major fund for the general fund. But then we have these other funds, HUD, development tax, center bond, convention center, whatever, that met the criteria, the two thresholds, 10% and 5% to be major funds. This column of other governmental funds is the sum of all the funds that failed those two tests. They were non-major, okay? So when you come over, you can see this total fund balance of 359,000 for these funds. And if a government wants to, it has the option of displaying the information probably in the uh, footnotes, the financial statement. It has the option of sitting there and giving you the detail of what constituted that one column that showed up on the face of the governmental fund. In this case, we we're talking about the balance sheet where we sat there and reported out the one column here in a footnote, probably they're giving you the detail of the non-major funds. Those are the funds that didn't meet the 10%, 5% test. Question? Uh, I, I have a question. It's not it's not on the, the thresholds, but remember how last class we were going over the different categories of monies, uh, assigned, unassigned? Mm-hmm. Um, I was just curious why, uh, for if it's just only the general fund can have an, a positive signed balance and the fund other balance. funds. Positive fund balance. Yeah. Positive signed fund balance. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Positive assigned fund balance. Then the other funds can only have a negative assigned unassigned. fund balance. Unassigned. 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 Sorry. Yeah. Unassigned is what I meant. Yeah. Why? Yeah. That doesn't. Just, yeah, because the notion is that those other funds, they got money that is by they don't they don't they don't give those funds money that then managers can decide, well, I'm gonna move around from one kind of function to another. So if you're talking about a capital project fund, I mean the money is pretty much there what restricted for some purpose to build this building right okay or it's in the form of inventory already and you know legislatures don't really sit there and tell you what to do with prop capital project funds so there's not going to be any committed um you know they probably won't really get too much off when you're calling out anything as a sign either because they can't decide how they're going to move money around. It's for the pro capital project. So you're probably going to see in the capital project fund restricted. You could see some non-spendable. You probably won't see committed. And if you do see an unassigned, it's going to be negative because there's probably some expense or commit, you know, some, I don't want to use the word commitment, um, there's some uh, obligation that they have outstanding there that they haven't found the funding for yet. <laughs> and they're going to have to probably ask the general fund to pull into its unassigned money that it can move around and help them to cover, you know, any deficits they might have. Gotcha. Okay. So like the unassigned for those other funds besides general is just excess expenditures that they can't pay. It sounds almost like that. Well, I don't know that they can't pay it because they might have. Sorry, they can't pay it from that fund specifically. Correct. Yeah. They can, okay. yes. yeah, they can't pay it from the resources they have there because those resources are. And for example, if you're talking about, and it kind of varies from fund to fund, maybe I should have said this last time. For example, if you're talking about the debt service fund, probably all their money is restricted. Any money that, get, that comes into the debt service fund is generally here, paid the service on the debt for it. So they probably will only have the category of restricted. Um, 
special revenue fund, uh, special revenue fund, probably, no, they might have some money that's committed because maybe the legislature said we're going to raise this revenue and we're going to spend it for um, at this revenue or might might be um, it might be considered restricted because the legislation might say we're going to raise this revenue and it has to be used for this purpose. So it'll probably be special revenue fund. Probably most of their money is going to be restricted. So, you know, there, I don't want to sit here and say it can only be this. It can only be that because Gatsby didn't say that. So I can't say that. Um, but I'm just saying, if you looked at a thousand, you know, special revenue funds, I bet you most of the time they'd have a restricted fund balance. And I'm saying that, and then there's something on the uh, screen here that's probably making a liar out of me, right? Is there? <laughs> okay, so here, um, well, they're at least keeping me, and these are not major funds, but they're keeping me honest on the what? On the um, debt service fund. They're keeping me fairly honest on the capital project fund. The special revenue fund, I guess they're saying that there could be some amounts that are what are assigned. I'm not exactly sure. Um, I guess maybe what they're saying there is, well, they're assigning money um, if they had some sort of maybe surplus left over from the um, from the revenue for whatever the special revenue funds about, and maybe they have some flexibility as to how they can move that around within the special revenue. But I'm not really sure why this would be assigned and. I guess it's possible. I can't think of an exact reason, but notice it's not like we saw for the general fund, just going back where the general fund had what? General fund, I think had money in every single category, right? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Okay, well, that's good to know that different yeah. different categories apply to different funds. It Well, well not, well, not apply differently, but most yeah, of the time, have, you're not going to see all the categories in one fund. <laughs> have a tendency towards one of the categories. Yeah. Yep. Okay. That's not, that's not my, yeah, that's my general fund. Okay, good. Good questions. Okay. All right, good. Um, now, uh, we talked about the long-term assets and liabilities only being reported at the government wide level, right? We talked about that. We talked about what in the um, proprietary funds, or I say only at the government wide level for our governmental funds. For proprietary funds, full accrual accounting, they will show long-term assets. Fiduciary funds, full accrual accounting, they will show um, capital assets, right? For our governmental funds, again, there are no capital assets. Same thing with our long-term liabilities. Yes, we report them at the government-wide level. Yes, we report them for our proprietary funds. Yes, for our fiduciary funds, um, not for the governmental funds. I think this is a good slide for you guys too. That's why I put these scary looking stars on here. Okay, and then it pretty much gave you uh, what we said about the measurement focus basis of accounting. And then I wrote in the accountability here, which is operational accountability for the government wide, for the governmental funds fiscal. Okay, but I think you know this already. Okay, but this is a good slide. When you take your test, I would definitely have this one sitting on the table. Okay, so whether you realized it or not, because I know it's been a while since we started chapter two. Uh, and when we were looking at chapter one, we had what we started this discussion saying, well, here's some detail about the MDNA. The long part of this chapter was, well, here's a look at how the financial statements, government wide fund financial statements, and these are some of the major elements of them, right? Now we're all the way to that bottom box required supplemental information other than the MDNA, 
Okay, and there's a variety of things that can go in there. Um, and I just wanna give you a sense of the nature of things that are in there, which here we're talking about budgetary comparison schedule. And basically they're going to have to show as part of that required supplemental information, the difference between the originally adopted budget, the amended budget, and then the final actual, okay? Now you look at that and then you look at this item A and they say computation of variances is optional. And you say, well, what the hell does that mean? You just told me I have to have a comparison. So why is required supplemental information? So why are you telling me that the variance is optional? Well, by that, what I'm trying to say to you here is this part is required. This is the RSI. You've got to have the comparisons, but what the variance column is optional. You don't have to show that variance column. Most governments do. Um, if we were to go back into the city of San Jose's financial report, we could sit there and I could show you the optional column. Okay. But, um, they don't have to do that. Most governments do. Okay, all right, let's do this quick exercise and then we, we wanna move on to get into chapter four. So um, what we have here is they want us to tell in this exercise, and I wouldn't give you something like this on your test because it's uh, your test is multiple choice, um, but this is probably a good exercise for us to do together. And they want us to tell whether these items here listed one through seven are part of the MDNA, part of the basic financial statements, meaning what? Government-wide fund financial statements or the notes, right? That's that middle box. Or three, are they the part of the GASB reporting model that constitutes required supplemental information other than MDNA? And I can see that I've taken all the fun out of this exercise for you by filling it in already, but let's just quickly make sure we understand why, what general fund statement of revenues, expenditures and changes in fund balance is like the income statement for my governmental funds. That's part of the basic financial statements, okay? Disclosure is basically saying footnote, footnotes are part of the basic financial statements, right? A description of the city's application of the modified cruel basis of accounting Every entity in the world will give you a summary of significant accounting policies. And that summary of significant accounting policies is a footnote disclosure that makes it part of the basic financial statements. So that one would be a little tricky because you might want to say, well, that sounds like an MDNA discussion. No, that is something that will be in the summary of significant accounting policies as part of the footnotes. Okay. Budget versus actual data, we just saw that. That was what we were seeing as part of the RSI other than MDNA. That's that bottom box, right? Okay, so that's why that has a three. Narrative analysis, we said that the MDNA was a financial narrative analysis of the um, financial activities of this government. So the word narrative tipped you off that that would be a one. Capital assets associated with governmental activities. That shows up on my statement of net position, a government-wide statement. Statement of cash flows, only the enterprise funds require that, but it is, again, part of the basic financial statements. Okay. I don't care about their concluding comments. That's why that struck out. Question. All righty. Let me, I don't know why I'm taking it out of tablet mode to do this. Uh, it makes me feel better. Let me close this and let's go ahead and start to go through chapter two, practice midterm, okay? So when you see these practice midterms, guys, the only difference between um, Taking it with me here and taking it when you take the exam is I will not have these answers highlighted, okay? So if you wanted to sort of practice this in testing mode, just to see how you're doing, you can take away the highlighting for an answer if you wanna do that, okay? And that's maybe not a bad practice for the exam itself, although it's open book for you open note, okay, any information that I provide you for this class, you can use on the exam, okay? 
what you can't do is go out to Chegg or something like that, or whatever these different, you know, pro, what is it, class hero or something. You know, there's nothing more annoying than seeing something on the internet. One time I saw somebody said, you can get the Becker books and they are the books that were marked by John Lord, you know, and I'm like, I didn't give anybody. And then the Becker said, did you give somebody your books? I'm like, no, it's their markings that they did in the book when I talked to them, you know, so I see all kinds of things. Oh, John Lord's course and course hero or something. You're not allowed to use that kind of stuff, but anything I give you that I give you, then you can use uh, for your exam. Okay. Uh, I think you can also under view, isn't there a way under view to um, take away, anybody know? I thought under, or maybe under review, somewhere in here, oh, hide ink, I think. You could also take it that way, maybe. Let's see. Give it a shot. Huh? I oh, just found a way to do shot. it in one step. <laughs> Um, I pressed Control A to highlight all. Control then, A. Yeah. And then oh, I just took highlight? off the highlight. Yeah. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah. And I saved that file as like a different name, like a Chapter Two Quiz Answers Removed. Yeah. So I can use it as a study guide. There you go. Yeah. And if you save it over the name of the file once you download it, nobody will kill you because you still have it on Canvas if you need to pull it down. You're like, oh God. It's still up there, right? On Canvas. Yeah, okay. exactly. Yeah. Okay, cool. That's a good way to do it. Control A. I'll try to remember that. Okay. All right. So let's go ahead, guys. And again, I don't know why to go to tablet in order to do all that. Let's put it back in tablet. And let's take a look at a couple of these uh, questions. And um, you want me to leave them highlighted to do this? Yes, no? Okay. I'm not unhighlight it might be better. That way we can shout it out if we know it. Okay. Let's do that. Hopefully I know the answer. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'll be okay. If, when it, I don't think there's many numerical ones in here. So would you say control A and then for review, what is it? Um, I went to to home, yeah, and then I chose no color. Okay. Exactly. Okay, good. All right, cool. All right, let's look at this. So which of the following funds all use current financial resources measurement focus? And we know the answer is A, because I don't think we have short-term memory problems. And it's because what all of these are governmental funds. Governmental funds are the ones that use current financial resources measurement focus. I'm not gonna look at B, C, and D because I know there must be mixed in there somewhere what, either a uh, proprietary fund or a fiduciary fund, right? Which will make those other choices the wrong answer. Right? So the answer here is A. Yep. I thought we didn't have shouting during this. Okay, all right, good. Okay, good. Let's take a look at the second one. Which of the following funds of Chessy City would be consolidated to form the governmental activities column? Okay, so what do you think? B? General, huh? Would it be B? General fund, debt service fund, capital project fund are absolutely in the governmental activities. Good. They didn't call it out here. But also what uh, the internal service fund and the permanent fund would be rolled up in there as well, because they are, well, that rounds out the governmental funds and uh, I guess uh, also special revenue fund, which isn't listed there in B. And again, the internal service fund is listed with the governmental activities. Good. Number three, stop me if there's a question, guys, otherwise I'm going to fly here. Okay, question three. Which of the following local government funds uses the accrual basis of accounting? Well, I know it's not any of these governmental funds. So I'm left with what? I'm left with A because governmental funds use modified accrual. Governmental funds use modified accrual. I'm gonna put the accent on the right part of that sentence. Okay. 
Okay, good. Number four, which of the following is the measurement focus and basis of accounting for government wide? Government wide is what? Economic resources, full accrual, right? Number four. I thought it was uh, for government wide, is I thought it was a uh, modified accrual. That's the government, yeah. governmental funds. Oh, okay. Government wide is full accrual, right? Got it. Okay. Yeah. That's that's the whole like all the funds, I guess, listed. Government wide is no government wide is the consolidated statements. So we've got the fund financial statements. Let's just do it like this. General fund, special rent fund, debt service fund, capital project fund, permanent fund. So here we've got G R S P P. That's my governmental funds. Then we have what? Then we have the internal service fund, the enterprise fund, that's proprietary. And then we have our fiduciary funds, right? Which is KIP, yeah, custodial investment trust fund, private purpose trust fund. And then I just have you just remember the P there, pension and other employee benefits, but we're just gonna remember pension for KIPP, right? C-I-P-P, -P, okay? And so then that's the fund level. And then at the government-wide level, we have government activities and we have business activity and we go ahead and um, we sort of lasso all of the governmental funds plus the internal service fund and we consolidate them. We consolidate and we convert. Okay. Because these are modified accrual current financial resources fiscal accountability focus, right? And we're going to consolidate them into what uh, the answer to this question, full accrual uh, economic resources. I'm just going to put economic resources, whatever, and uh, operational accountability. So we have to not only consolidate them, we have to convert them, at least in the case of the governmental statements from modified accrual to full accrual. When we're dealing with our business type activity, we don't have to do that conversion because our business type activity is also full accrual. Gotcha, okay. Economic resources. I think just what threw me off was the conversion. I forgot about that. <laughs> Yeah, and then the fiduciary statements are also full accrual, but they're not reported. We don't consolidate them up under the, because uh, we're not, there is no operational accountability focus. You're not using the resources of those fiduciary funds in the operation of your government. If you did, they probably got a nice, you'll be showering with strangers at some point, probably because you're not supposed to you know, use those for operation of the government. And there's some pretty legal you know, traps you can get into if you start to mess that up, okay? So um, that's the way that works. And so that's why it's economic resources for the government-wide statements, not the governmental fund financial statements, okay? Got it. Thank you. So who was asked the question? Uh, was it Breno? Yeah, it's me. Okay. Well, you're on the hook then to answer this next one. Oh, then uh, current <laughs> finance, financial resources. Good. Excellent. Right? Because now we're talking about the governmental fund. Good. Excellent. Okay. All right. Nice. Let's look at this one. Uh oh, now I'm in trouble because I lost the answer and I got a, numbers. Okay. 
Just kidding. I think I can answer this. So we've got what? Hannah City had a total fund balance in the general fund as of the end of the year of $1,560,000. Assume the following, blah, blah, blah. And then they want to know what should be um, what should be reported as unassigned fund balance and assigned fund balance. Okay. Now, unassigned is anything that didn't get stuck into another group, right? So I'm going to go ahead and pick up the entire one, five, six, five, oh, oh, oh. Okay. And then I'm going to start to peel off amounts based on what they're telling me here that should go to different groups. So the first one, or maybe they don't go to a different group. Maybe they should stay here. Let's see, as unassigned. So I'm going to assume starting out that everything is unassigned, and then I'm going to work and whittle off of that as I go along. So how about budget officer decides to set aside 405000 for new road maintenance? Is that money unassigned still by the end of no. the year? Unassigned. Good. Oh, that's assigned. Good. That money, very good, guys. That money is going to be what? Assigned. And it's assigned because what? An employee decided to do that, right? A budget officer is an employee. They're not a legislator. They are not outside the government. They're what? They're inside the government. So that money is considered, it's not restricted. It's not committed. It can only then be assigned, right? Because they have decided how to use that, okay? So as part of answering this question from a computational standpoint, I'm going to subtract off that 405. Okay. All right. Good. Second bullet. Unspent restricted drug, drug enforcement money. What do you think? <laughs> okay. That's not. Uh, well, no, it has the word restricted in it. That money is restricted, right? It's, yeah, it's restricted. Even if it's unspent, right? Well, all, all, all this money is going to be assumed unspent. If something's still sitting in fund balance, I haven't spent the money yet, right? Let me ask yes. you a question. If something's sitting in retained earnings, have I spent it yet? If no. I have amounts sitting in retained earnings, have I spent it yet? No. no. I think it's not. No. no. So if it's sitting in fund balance, because fund balance is like retained earnings, I haven't spent the money yet. But there's a label on the money that says when you spend it, you will spend it for this, right? And I'm describing the nature of the conversation for restricted there. They're saying you got 75, what is it, 75,000? And when you spend it, you're going to spend it on drug enforcement, right? I don't know, whatever it is they do with drug enforcement money, right? Guys? Yes, yes, sir. Agreed. Yeah. Yes, sorry. Okay. I don't know so, what they're spending drug enforcement money for. You know, what do they do? So somebody has a drug problem. And so what they want to do is they want to go and bust that person's door down in the middle of the night and say, give us the drugs. Is that really the way to go? I mean, don't you think it might be better to try to, you know, kind of calmly work with that person who's obviously having a problem with their life, you know, no, let's go and bust down the door in the middle of the night and take all that risk that we might shoot the wrong person. <laughs> that makes a lot of sense. I'm sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> sorry, guys. Was there a question that was coming out before I went off on that tangent? Well, I agree with you, but um, <laughs> I'm just not sure uh, so restricted is like a higher category of restriction than assigned. So it does a restricted fund. Wait, wait, whoa, 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 stop. Stop. Sure. I got to stop you because it's kind of like when the music teacher wants somebody to play a song and they start to mess it up at the beginning. Okay. So, you know, uh, let's use the word committed. Okay. So uh, not committed, constraint. Let's use the okay. word constraint. So constraint. Sure is remember we okay let's back up we had um we had non-spendable which was the hardest to spend mm -hmm. 
uh, which was the most constrained. And yes. then we had spendable, and then we list them in order of constraint it was restricted, committed, assigned, and unassigned. Raquel. Raquel, very good. So restricted is sort of the um, highest constraint on fund balance, uh, on spendable fund balance. Correct. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. So does that then um, like grant it the lower statuses like assigned as well? Are restricted funds assigned? No. Restricted okay. funds are restricted. Okay. They Thank go you. from restricted to gone. <laughs> so in this case, then the unspent drug enforcement grant would not be assigned. No, it's restricted. I understand that it's restricted. I guess what I'm asking is, are they mutually exclusive? Yes. Okay, cool. Yeah. Yeah. You're, you can't be in two categories at once. You're either restricted or you're, um, you know, you, you either restrict your, you're one of the categories. You can't be in two categories at the same time. The same dollars can't be in the same category at the same time. Where I think you're going with your question is, well, wait a minute. Um, of that money that's restricted for drug enforcement, don't they have to decide how much they want to spend on Kevlar vests versus pamphlets on how not to get on drugs or whatever? you know, a drug therapy, let's say, right? And yes, but that doesn't constitute a reporting responsibility of the nature that we're talking about, right? You don't have to sit there and parse out of my restricted money, because I have to use it for drug enforcement and it was restricted by enabling legislation or it was restricted by um, external like for bondholders and that you don't have to start parsing out and of that restricted money i'm going to use this much for this this much for that and i mean you could probably if you wanted to have an optional disclosure that might start to call some of those things out or maybe in your um, comprehensive annual financial report in that statistical section you might start to talk about the nature of some of those things, but from what we're talking about for the GASB standards, they don't start telling you, then you have to parse out your restricted this way. Okay, so when we're talking about money either being assigned or um, money being assigned, it goes from unassigned to assigned. The entity had free hand as to how they were gonna spend this money it was up to the managers to decide how they were going to spend that money and they are spending it on, um, you know, they can't go to Vegas with the money, but in the context of the government, they are spending it for um, uh, solar panels for the schools is the example I think we had. No, now we got to fix it and spend it for history books instead. So since those managers can change their mind as to how they move money that's unassigned around unassigned uh assigned is just ahead of unassigned in Raquel, right correct it's like the lowest level of constraint Ye well other than unassigned yeah okay because uh, unassigned i'd say unassigned is what we consider unconstrained <laughs> okay but yeah you're right in a way Yes, but it's unassigned is the lowest level and then um, assigned. Okay, good. Any other question? So that's that uh, 70,000 and I don't think I drew the line from the right place. Maybe that was what was confusing folks. Okay, all right, good. And then we have the third bullet, the county's governing board passed a resolution to use 500,000 the governing board of the county. So that's a sign then. Well, committed. committed. Good. I'm going to subtract it off. Oh, okay. It should have gotten you the right answer because it's not unassigned. Um, but this one's committed because the governing board, you know, 
they should be a little more careful. The governing board, you know, what is it? The Council of Elders? You know, they should be a little more <laughs> descriptive that they're talking about a legislature there. So they should probably say the legislature, but they're kind of making you figure out that the governing board is the legislature. And when the legislature sets money aside, that is committed. Okay, good. So what's the difference, I guess, between like a sign and committed because to me it seemed like the governing board Different had people decided yeah. a complete an elected official decided how to spend this money assigned can be determined by some alcoholic who's been working for the government for 40 years with a flask in the bottom of their desk of course the gotcha. i guess i was just a little confused because too but, huh I guess I was just a little confused because it said the budget officer in 405 was given the authority by the governing board. That's why I, I guess I kind of thought it was the, the signing committee were the same in this case. Huh? Oh, the governing board had previously given her this authority. Um, yeah, given her the authority to do her work as a budget officer. Got it. Okay. Yeah. So the position, you know, it's not like after she um, leaves the government, she can come back and say, by the way, the governing board gave me the authority. So build a nice park next to my house because I have, I'm the budget officer and it says my name. They give the position budget officer the authority to make these kind of decisions. So the, granted though, it's a good question because they did put that in there to confuse me. Definitely. Okay, good. So when you do the math on that, I don't really need to do the math because only what? Only the, oh no. So is it C or is it looks like eyeballing it? It must be C, right? Yes. Doing the math? Yes. Okay, good. Okay, let's look at this next one, but before we do that, I want to see. I don't know why I still have that open. I can get rid of that. Um, let's see. I think the best way for me to do this is to find chapter two again. Please be here. Of course, it's not. Yeah. Okay, I guess I'll have to do it this way. Because every time I put this question up, um, everybody misses it. And I don't want to go through that. So remember, can you see all that? When we were going through our governmental fund statement of revenues, expenditures, and changes in fund balance. Come on. Okay. We had, um, that's a little hard to see, so you're gonna have to look close, but remember we did this thing where we said revenues, minus expenditures and that that was sort of like uh, our operating income and we would call that out as and you can kind of see it right here excess of revenues um excess or deficiencies of revenue over expenses remember that and then we continued on to the next page the next slide and in that lower section of the statement of revenues expenditures and change in fund balance we reported things that were sort of like non operating and those included the other financing sources and uses and we said that there were what two financing sources bond proceeds long term debt proceeds and um, transfers in and then we said there was only one other financing use transfer out Remember that conversation? Yes. Okay. Okay, good. So with that as a mini little review there, let's now look at this question seven. Okay, so we're right here. 
which of the following will not affect the excess of revenue over expenditures? Well, how about the purchase of a capital asset? Excess of revenue over expenditures is revenue minus expenditures. It's like the operating income, right? So will the purchase of a capital asset affect that number? Yeah. Yes, it will. So therefore it can't be the right answer, right? Because when we purchase equipment, we debit expenditure. How about paying salaries? Yes. Salaries are treated as an expense, even in commercial accounting, right? How about property taxes levied and collected in the year? For a government, what are, how does a government generate revenue? Taxes. Taxes. So property taxes are what? Revenues are going to affect the revenue, uh, excess of revenue over expenditures. Good. How about other financing source? And of course, it's the only one left now that we haven't uh, eliminated D. And what's happening? Well, we saw that we have revenues, we have expenditures, we have the excess slash deficit of revenues over expenditures. And then we keep going down and that's where you see the other financing sources and uses, right? After that line item, excess of revenue over expenditures. Question? Yeah, but I have a question. So I think you talked about this last class, but expenditures are only used in the governmental funds. Is that correct? That's correct. Um, yeah, expenditure is the only term, you only use that term for the governmental fund. They don't want to call it expense because expense is kind of sounding like expired. And it's not an expired cost if you purchase the long term asset, with it, right? Right. And then so my question, I guess, then is for C, property taxes levied and collected in the year. Uh -huh. Do they have to be collected for it to be revenue since they use the modified accrual? Um, we're going to get to that in revenue recognition. Um, and the answer to your question is no. But by saying collected in the year, then it absolutely is revenue. Right. So I guess my question would just have been, it, would there be revenue if the taxes were levied but not collected? Um, like, like would, would the government be... recognize that taxes is levied as being actual revenue? Well, levy means that they sent the bills out. Right. And it depends on when we would be able to use those funds. Okay. So really C is technically problematic um, right. if you really think deeply about revenue recognition which we're getting ready to do here in a minute because um, you could levy the tax and collect it and it would still not be a revenue if you're not allowed to use it in the period in which you actually levied and collected so you can levy in one year not have it be a revenue because you can't use the money until you um enter that year and then and i'm talking governmental funds here with some limitation and the limitation we'll use in this class will be 60 days you could collect it in the third year and still have it be a revenue in the second year so okay. i levy the tax in year one i don't collect it until year three and it's revenue in year two okay Okay, but we're going to get more into that. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so yeah, C's got a little bit of a, you know, I used to immediately call the textbook providers about stuff like this. And then, you know, you ever have the experience like you're talking to somebody and you realize they're not listening to you? <laughs> so I started having that experience all the time. Sorry, what was that, Professor? No, I'm just kidding. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, in my profession, you get that experience a lot. Okay, so, all right. so let's take a look at number eight. Uh, which of the following would be classified as very good, by the way, touche. <laughs> which of the following would be classified as other financing sources uses? 
How about purchase of capital asset? No. No, that's an expense, the expenditure, right? Good. How about proceeds from the issuance of a six month note payable? I would say so. Ah, uh, ah, uh, 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 what movie was that? Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, I got you because what? Six month means it's not long-term. It's long-term debt proceeds gotta be what? More than one year. Oh, uh, gotcha. If you got proceeds in a situation for a six month note payable. It's just like, you know, commercial accounting, you would debit cash, you'd credit what? Note payable, and you would report that note payable on your governmental fund uh, balance sheet because it's a short-term liability, it's a current liability, right? So that one was there to trick you. It can't be B, that's an A. Professor, if it's more than, if it's more than one year, do we credit other financial? Yeah. So yeah, I mean, as a rule of thumb, you know, I mean, you know, sometimes I talk and hear like God came down and said, always do this or you shall be destroyed, you know, and then you talk to somebody that, you know, uh, works for the city of San Jose, they might say, well, look, we have a criteria of two years because, da, 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 da. you know, but the rule of thumb and in this class, yes, if it's more than one year, um, it should be, you know, one year or more, then it should be long term. And the other financing sources, yes. Okay, thank you. Yeah, very good. Yeah. Okay. C transfer from an internal service fund. Yes. Yeah. There are two other financing sources, transfer in and what? And long-term debt proceeds, like we just talked. There's one other financing use transfer out. Good. Okay, and special item is something that's special, and so they just have a special place for it on the statement of revenues, expenditures, and change of fund balance. Which of the items does not properly appear on the statement of revenues, expenditures, and changes in fund balance of a governmental fund? How about expenditures? Does that not appear? No. No, it does not not appear. So it does appear, right? So that's not correct. How about expenditure? Notice, guys, I'm intentionally ignoring the label that they're putting here. What kind of label is this? That's a what? Character label, right? Character tells you the period of benefit. And if you put debt service, you put capital outlay, even though you're treating it as an expenditure, users of the financial statement should know that that expenditure is what having expected benefit that will ex extend beyond the current period, right? What if it was only gonna benefit the current period? What, lab what character label should I put on it? Short term. No, let me say it again. What if it was gonna only benefit the current period? What label should I put on it? Current? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Very good. So just expenditures How current? Yeah, you can put expenditures current. So it allows the user of the financial statements to say, okay, I see that you're spending money on uh, from the special revenue fund and it's a capital expenditure. So I can expect to see steamrollers all over town, right? More seriously, okay, this government spent some money on a hard, you know, on a long, longer term item. So I don't expect that expenditure because that's a big expenditure. What you spent 10 million? Oh, I see 10 million capital. So I don't expect to see that 10 million coming around again anytime soon, right? So it gives you some sense as to what the period of benefit there uh, through that character designation. Okay. Property taxes receivable. 
Should that be on the statement of revenues, expenditures, and change in fund balance? No. No, it's a balance sheet item. Receivable is a current asset. That's on the balance sheet. So the answer is beginning fund balance. And I'm not going to try to flip back, but just visualize we had what? We had on the statement of revenues, expenditures, and change in fund balance. Revenue minus expenses gave us excess of revenue over expenditures. Then we had what? Then we had our uh, other financing sources and uses, other financing sources, two, long-term debt proceeds and transfer in, other financing use, one, transfers out. Sometimes we might have those special items and then all that rolled up into the change in fund balance, which was like net income. And then we had what? Beginning balance of fund balance. We folded in the change. We had the ending balance in fund balance, right? Is that how it looked? I would tell you to close your eyes to visualize all that, but I'm afraid you won't be able to open them again if I do, okay? So you want to get that whole little scenario in your head as to how that works. It'll help you with questions like that. So okay. wouldn't oh, the answer be C? Yeah, because- Oh, because sorry, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. balance is on there. It is proper. Correct. Correct, sorry. Yeah, I forgot what we were looking for here. It's what, which one does not, and it's receivables are balance sheet on. Thank you, yes. Yep. Just testing you. Okay. All right. Good. Number 10. Well, thank you for, for, for helping with that. Number 10. Which of the following funds would be reported as a fiduciary fund? The private purpose trust. Yeah. Good. Number 11, modified accrual basis of accounting should be used for which of the following funds? Gotta be the capital project fund is the governmental fund, right? Uh, which of the following amounts are identified at the end of the fiscal year would be classified as restricted? Oh, here we go. Well, this one, they gave me the answer, <laughs> but let's look. Resources, let's, let's call out the category for the other ones. Resources that the city manager has set aside for a major street repair. Assigned. Assigned. Good. Um, let's move to the third choice. Significant amount of inventory. Non-spendable. Good. Oh yeah, I remember, I have a problem with this question. Endowment resources that the city must maintain in perpetuity. There's a problem with this question because if they tell me that I have to maintain money in perpetuity, that means that I have to maintain a certain amount of the principal forever. Well, that money's restricted. Gen generally, that money is coming from somebody outside of the government who's donated money and said, use this money and maintain the, maintain the principal forever, but use the interest. So it's probably a permanent fund. So I don't know why they put this here. This is confusing to me. I don't know what they mean by this. I don't know what they're talking about. If they have to maintain endowment resources, the city must maintain in perpetuity, that's like a restriction. That is a restriction. I don't know what they're talking about. Federal grant used for playground equipment, I agree with, because what? The federal grant came from outside of the state or local government. What is this, a city? Okay, I don't know who they're talking about here, but we're not talking about federal government. So whether it's a state, whether it's a city, whatever, they are getting this money from outside of the uh, local government, from the federal government, so that money is restricted. I can't answer you. Anyone got any thoughts on D? I don't know. I don't get it. I think this is a problem. Okay. All right, good. Let's look at this. And uh, 
Who wants to help me with this one? We're trying to figure out major funds here. So is the general, general fund good? Okay. I know that. Okay, good. Hey, that didn't help you, but okay. <laughs> Maybe it's next time it will, because all the choices doesn't help you, because all the choices had general fund, right? Okay, good. So now what do we got to do for these other ones, the library and the debt service? It's got to oh, be ten percent and five percent threshold. Good. Should, eyeballing it, it looks like it does meet that for the library fund. <laughs> Were you eyeballing the answer? <laughs> no, because ten percent of twenty-six million is two point six million, and. 5% of 51 million is 2.5 million. So what do we got here? 2,630,000, am I doing yep. my math right? And for the 51,250, um, well, we got to add these two together, right? And then take 5% of that. So what's the 20, uh, 26, three plus 51, 250? Why, why do you have to add them together? I don't Isn't think we have to add them. 250 already incorporating to the total governmental fund? Yeah, it is. It says it right there. Oh, okay. I, I thought it was just the, uh, that was just the enterprise fund. Okay, thank you. So for that one, I got to do 0 0.05. And I get what? Two million five hundred sixty-two thousand five hundred. Okay, good. And so now I look back, and when I look at, be nice for them to tell me. Oh yeah, they're telling me it's assets. Okay, good. So library funds got it right. Meets both, and the debt service fund. Oops, didn't meet. Now they don't tell me anything about uh, just based on assets. If it didn't make it for assets, it could still make it for liabilities revenues. But since it didn't pass the 10% test, it's not a major fund. So it's just the general fund in the library. Good. Okay. How does GASB recommend governments report budgetary information Budgetary comparison schedule, whatnot, is part of the RSI. We saw that. Okay. Oh, okay. Um, the basis of accounting that should be used in preparing the fund financial statements, I think we all know by now, modified accrual for the governmental, accrual for the proprietary, accrual for the fiduciary, right? See? I'm trying to... Trying to Okay, see, right? Okay. All right, good work, guys. Let's take a quick break and we will come back at 315 and we will start to knock out chapter four, at least chapter 4A. All right? Sounds good. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Professor. See you in a few minutes. Is this that the end of class? See you in a little while. Ten minutes. Somebody remind me to start the recording back when we come back, please. I'm gonna resume the recording, and uh, let's go Take ahead. Care. Huh? Yeah. I was about to say, but uh, yeah. Yeah, no, I, I got going again here, so we should be good there. And let's go ahead and jump ourselves into now chapter four. And really what I've done with chapter four is I've broken it into two pieces, uh, 4A and 4B. So 4A is going to focus on revenue recognition and then 4B was going to say, okay, we've got some revenue. Now we're going to budget for the spending and actually spend that revenue. Okay, so basically uh, that will be the two pieces of chapter four, 4A, 4B. Okay, now when we talk about revenue recognition here, and I just want to 
fast forward a little bit here because um, again, in a class where I meet once a week and you know, we were talking about some things, let's say last week and now, but well, we've been talking about all this stuff all along. So I don't need to review nearly as much, but I do wanna to point to the operating statements, both government-wide and the fund statements. So what we're really talking about here when we get into revenue recognition is have we met the criteria to even report a revenue on our statement of activities at the government wide level, or if we're talking about what the fund level, have we met the criteria? And again, we don't need to go back through all what we have talked about in terms of the different categories of revenue stuff before we did that last time. I don't want to review that because we just talked about it Tuesday. Uh, but uh, when we're dealing with our funds, have we met the criteria to even recognize a revenue at the fund level? Okay, And we're going to see that there's a difference between the revenue recognition rules for full accrual, which is what we do at the government wide level versus modified accrual. Okay, So we're talking about our governmental funds, revenue recognition at first, and what do we have to do to report things at the government total fund level? What do we have to do to report revenue at the government wide level? There's gonna be a difference in the criteria, okay? So you come over, and again, we did these other things last time. I wanna start right here. So really starting here, okay? And remember, we talked about deferred inflow. And we're going to start to understand more about this this time, because what happens when we look at revenue in order for something to be considered a revenue, we have to meet both eligibility and time. Now, eligibility is really kind of a, the lesser thing that we have to think about than time. Okay, eligibility very rarely is something that we have to think much about because if we're getting government, say, um, getting, I should say, revenue, getting taxes from, say, income tax, is a government eligible to collect the income tax? And please don't give me an anarchist speech about how the government is not eligible to get income tax because uh, people who believe that generally end up spending some time behind bars. Okay, so... Uh, does the government have it eligible for income tax to collect income tax? Yes. Yes, they are. Try telling them they're not sometimes. It's like say, you know, uh, when you've got the Marines and the Navy on your side, okay, you're probably going to be doing pretty good in terms of taking money from people. Okay. I, I, so, used, to, I used to work at the IRS reviewing 1040s when they came in. And every once yeah. in a while, like every pack would have, every pack of a hundred would have someone with, who wrote a handwritten letter saying how this is theft and the government's not allowed to do this, but here's my return anyway, but this is illegal. It was pretty funny. And you would turn them over to the investigation team, right? <laughs> yeah, 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 you, 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 you had to pass those on, so you could, like, be put on a list or something. You know, reading tax returns is fun. I was on an assignment at, at GAO. Uh, where they asked us to look to see if the auditors that had gone in and looked at the tax returns when they did an audit had determined whether or not the uh, taxpayer had issued 1099s that they should have. So we were looking at their Schedule Cs and seeing if they reported miscellaneous expenses. Was there an inquiry about the 1099s? And uh, Every now and then, you know, you'd be, we were looking at real life tax returns and you'd get stuff like that in there. And, you know, like uh, a lot of times people were saying, well, I thought I had a refund coming and trying to explain these different things that they were doing so it can be interesting. The thing that was particularly interesting in that job is I ended up going on an audit with an IRS agent. And it was an audit where we were following up the second time. So part of our procedure was to go back out with the IRS agent to the same audit, they, uh, audit victim they had gone to before and see if through that process, we found that there were any 1099s that should have been issued that were not. 
And there was this one time where this lady was upset because this is now her second time being audited. You know, she's like, well, I don't understand why I keep getting audited. I know people that don't even pay their taxes and don't get audited. Of course, you don't say that in front of an IRS agent. IRS agent, would you like to give me those people's names? No, well, no. <laughs> so anyway, but uh, yeah, you see some weird things in tech. In exchange for not being audited, I'd give those names. <laughs> Yeah, you know, I think there's a crime against that, too. <laughs> the uh, IRS agent, you know, took pity on her and didn't keep her. Don't you get her. like a like a piece, like if you if you if, if you report to the IRS, someone's not paying taxes, the IRS gives you like a portion of how much they yeah. need to pay in tax? Yeah, I think so. There's some kind of reward that goes along with that. Of course, then, you know, you got to spend the rest of your life looking over your shoulder. But yeah, um, I interviewed for the IRS and then I'll stop with the boring stories, guys. I interviewed with the IRS and uh, so they asked me, well, let's say that you were working for the IRS and you heard your neighbor in the next cubicle over being audited by an agent and you heard them denying that they had revenue meanwhile you knew you know that they had income that should be taxed meanwhile you knew that they had all kinds of money what would you do and you know kid coming from hayward i said well i wouldn't do anything <laughs> it's not my job to you know go around auditing my papers <laughs> and we <laughs> there goes my rejection letter from the IRS. <laughs> so anyway but um so let's just go back eligibility okay the government's eligible to get the taxes that it gets we're going to see that eligibility only comes in in very specific cases okay time is where we're going to spend most of our time focusing no pun intended okay so what happens a government has to be able to spend the money in the period that they have it in order to take it as a revenue, okay? If they haven't met the time requirements yet, then that money is considered a deferred inflow, okay? Now, if for whatever reason they've received that money and they haven't met eligibility nor time, and again, it happens in rare case where they haven't met eligibility yet, then that is a unearned revenue. You can't call it a deferred revenue because they saved the D word for deferred inflow. So you can call it unearned revenue. You can call it revenue collected in advance, but you can't call it deferred. And that's when you haven't met neither eligibility nor time. Generally, what happens is you're just kind of up here. Okay, you get some money. You haven't met time yet. That means you're a deferred inflow. You're a cocoon until you... Uh, until you meet your time requirement, then you're a butterfly, your revenue, okay? It is a rare case where we see some money coming in that goes through all three steps of these cycles. It is possible. We're gonna have sort of a very specific example towards the end of the discussion here that was specifically designed to go through all three of those stages, but generally you're going to go, uh, you're going to go here, to revenue, deferred inflow to revenue as you meet the time requirement. Um, or you could go from a situation where you go straight from not being eligible to revenue. That happens sometimes and that they say, well, you have to meet a certain criteria before we'll give you this money and before you've earned this money. And if that's the case, then you go straight to um, revenue from, um, from liability. On occasion, we will have a situation. And again, we designed it just to prove that you could go through all three categories. On occasion, you'll have to go through each step. Okay. Okay, good. So that's just a silly visual there uh, to help you understand the nature of these uh, different amounts that come in falling into these three categories. Okay, now the most important thing is four categories here. Um, when we're evaluating whether or not we have earned a revenue or not, depends on what type of revenue it is, okay? Now, the four items that are listed here are non-exchange revenue, 
What is non-exchange revenue? Non-exchange revenue means that you pay your taxes and you expect the government to be there when you need them. So, you know, you pay your taxes, you expect the police to be there when you need them. Someone steals from you, you help police, you know, you don't expect the police to come up to and say, yeah, and say, go get them. Well, look, uh, here's the price list I have on foot. It's going to cost you this and the car that. And for a little extra, I'll make them pay the ultimate price, right? No. What happens? You sit there and you pay your taxes. You expect the police to be there when you need them, right? So most taxes are non-exchange, okay? So we have our different non-exchange, derived, imposed non-exchange, government mandated non-exchange and voluntary non-exchange. But all of these are considered non-exchange. You pay and then you expect the government to do what it's supposed to do for you, okay? <clears throat> now, when I say you pay, not the government, but the individual who pays that money, okay? Now, under full accrual accounting, we say that we recognize revenue when we have met eligibility and time. We saw that on the butterfly slide. But again, the one that really we're going to be working on here is time, okay? Now, if something does not meet eligibility, then it's a liability. We saw that on the slide. That means you're still down there as a caterpillar, okay? And if we meet eligibility but not time, we are deferred inflow. And again, most of the time, we're gonna be dealing with the situation where money comes in. And the question is, have we met the time requirements so we can take it from a deferred inflow to a uh, revenue, okay? Now, modified accrual, also you have to meet eligibility and time, but time now gets a little bit more interesting because now, and I wanna circle, I wanna do something to touch that 60 days, but I can't because Zoom isn't letting me, okay, there I go. I have my Zoom bar down there and it won't let me circle on that bottom part, okay? But um, time now says that for modified accrual, so now when we're down in our governmental funds, we must collect the money in a period close enough to the balance sheet date in order for it to be considered money of that previous period. So what happens? My year ends December 31st. And let's say my criteria is 60 days. Even though I haven't collected the money yet in January, I'm still within 60 days if I have a December 31st year end. If I haven't collected the money by February, I'm still within 60 days. So I can still count that as revenue in year one. So I don't collect the money in January of year two, still revenue of year one. I don't collect the money until February, end of February of year two, it's still year one money. If I don't collect that money until say March 15th, well now I'm beyond the 60 days, that would be revenue of year two under modified accrual accounting. For accrual accounting, I would count that as revenue of year one. So accrual accounting does not consider the 60 day, modified accrual considers the 60 day. Now I'm gonna be looking at this in more detail here with a couple of examples in a minute, but I wanna say right now that 60 days is a rule of thumb. And a lot of the literature says, and um, the company, the governmental entity is following the GASB requirement of 60 days. GASB does not require 60 days. GASB says, will the money be available soon enough to finance expenses, liabilities of the current period, liabilities of the current period? And that could be 60 days for some governments. It could be 30 days for other governments. Other governments, it could be 90. Some governments, it could be all the way up to 180 days. It just depends on the flow of when they have to pay their liabilities, okay? In this class, we will always use 60 days. We will always use 60 days. In this class, we will always use 60 days, okay? All right, so these are the categories. And what we're going to do is we're going to uh, 
first talk generically about how governmental funds will account for their taxes receivable. And the main takeaway here is what happens if there are taxes that are deemed to be uncollectible. Then we'll start to get into those criteria that you saw on that previous slide, okay? So hold the thoughts on the previous slide. Let's talk about what happens uh, when we're using um, our, our governmental funds to bill, send out tax bills, okay? And there's basically some amount that is considered to be uncollectible, okay? So we come over, don't worry about this. I put leave this slide in here, this dual track approach, because when we look at some of these journal entries, we're going to be looking and say, well, this is the journal entry that you make if you're at the fund level. This is a journal entry that you make if you're at the government wide level. And um, that's a good way of studying this. And then the book tries to justify that method of studying the material and tells this huge lie here that um, you know governments will someday get to this point where they do things where they have two general ledgers. And I'm telling you that will never happen. What state and local governments do is they record everything at the fund level and then they make adjustments to do what? To convert to the um, to the full accrual at, for the government wide level as they convert and consolidate, okay? But the way we're gonna study it, we're gonna look to see the difference between the journal entries at the two levels. Now, having said that, for what we're about to look at, there really is no difference, okay, between the government wide level and the fund level, okay? So right now, what we're talking about here, and we're really focusing on what happens if there's some taxes that are uncollectible and how that should be handled. There's no difference between what you do at the fund level and the government wide level, okay? So let's say this government mails out tax bills for 500,000 and they determine that, um, what is that? 1% of it is not collectible, okay? What do they do? they debit the tax receivable current gross, they set up an allowance for uncollectible current taxes. Current means it's not, doesn't mean it's a current asset. It means they're not delinquent yet. They're not late yet, okay? So we go ahead and we credit the um, current taxes here, uncollectible, receivable and uncollectible for current taxes. And we reduce the revenue <clears throat> by the amount we think we can't collect. Now, is that the same thing you do in commercial for an uncollectible situation? Yes. Try again. No. <laughs> <laughs> no. In government, you would do what? I mean, not in government, in commercial, you would debit accounts receivable 500. You would credit the what? The revenue gross. And then you would go ahead and do what? Debit bad debt expense for 5,000, just using these same numbers, and credit the allowance, right? In government, we're reducing the revenue because what? You don't recognize an expense because there is no exchange here. An expense is saying, look, I incurred this expense to generate this revenue. The government is not involved in an exchange transaction. It's not exchange. So if that's the case and you mail out tax bills and somebody doesn't pay you, you just reduce the revenue by the amount you're not going to collect. In business, because we're trying to match the revenue and the expense, we actually take the revenue gross and then take the expense. Okay? So there is a difference. Okay, good. Now, what happens? The nice thing about being a government, you send out tax bills and everybody says, well, you know, I'm not gonna wait for them to do something for me. I better send this in. So they send the money in. So they debit cash, they credit taxes receivable current. Now there's still what? 50,000 floating around out there, right? And so what happens? They go ahead and they decide that for this 50,000, they're going to reclass it from current to delinquent. So they go ahead and they debit the taxes receivable delinquent to put it into delinquent. They credit the taxes receivable current to take it out of current. So it's a simple reclass. 
We are not reclassing it from non-current, from current asset to non-current. It's still a current asset. We are simply changing the label on this current asset tax receivable from what? From current, meaning they're not past due, to delinquent, meaning they are past due on paying this. Since we reclassed the receivable, we also reclass the um, allowance. So we go ahead and we debit taxes, um, allowance for uncollectible taxes current to take it out of the current, credit allowance for uncollectible taxes delinquent to take it out of the, uh, to put it into the delinquent. Question? Okay, good. Then they go ahead. Uh, sorry, I had a question. So in the previous, I thought you were saying that this is what we shouldn't do because this is like what they're doing in commercial or I could be getting confused. No, all we're all what this slide right here. Yeah. All we did was reclass the remaining 50,000 out of delinquent and put it into uh, out of current and put it into delinquent, right? Oh, so we just moved it. Yeah. Got so it. We, okay. Yeah. Right, because we had taxes receivable, and I'll put a C there, current, that was 500,000. That's what we originally debited it for. We credited it for 450 for the collection, so there's still a balance of 50,000 in there, right? Right? Yeah. And so we said, well, you know what? Now these people are late. So we create this account called tax receivable delinquent and we credit the current that zeroes that out right and we uh, debit the delinquent so now it's just simply been reclassed into delinquent and then we do the same thing with the allowance gotcha yeah okay good okay okay good now they set up some penalties now because i guess these people are getting late and you know it kind of gets annoying because now you set up a new revenue for the penalties but now you're saying well i may not collect some of these penalties so you set up an allowance for the penalties okay then you finally decide to go ahead and um, oh sorry guys all this is is different accounts that so the the accounting is the same but they're using different account names is if it's at the what if it's at the fund level versus the government wide level but the logic of the accounting is the same you're to, you're laying out tax bills for penalties you're setting up a receivable for penalties and then you're going ahead and putting so much in the allowance and it's simply different account names at the fund level versus the government wide level sometimes i think i should just take this out and just say it's the same accounting at both levels but they do have slightly different names of the accounts at the two levels. So uh, that's why I guess I leave this in. Not a big deal. Okay, now we go ahead and we finally decide to write off some of these amounts that are uncollectible. Okay, so when you write something off, you debit the allowance, you credit the receivable, and this is just like commercial, right? Once you get to the write-off stage. Okay. Any question? Okay, good. Again, our major focus, that's just some basic allowance accounting is the takeaway from that. Okay, let's get back to the revenue recognition, our four categories. Okay, now when we go through and we look, it's better to consider it by category. And this slide, is one that I would sleep with under your pillow, okay? Because this one kind of brings it all together for us. So what happens? All of these are non-exchange. We have derived non-exchange, okay? Derived non-exchange means that it, deri the, it derives its value from some underlying transaction. Examples are sales tax, income tax. So what's the underlying transaction that we derive sales tax from? Not a trick question. A uh, purchase. Sales. Sales, right? There were sales and we're the government, we're gonna get sales tax, right? Okay. Income, it's the person working for that year, whatever, right? 
Good. Okay. Now, notice the only type of requirement is time. Again, we're not getting into, you know, the letters that was received. The government's not eligible. Income tax, the government is eligible. So we're only worried about time. So we recognize revenue when the underlying transaction takes place. So if that's the case, if the sale takes place in 2020, is that 2020 revenue or 2021 revenue? 2020. That's 2020 revenue because the sale took place in 2020. If the sale takes place in 2021, is that 2021 revenue or 2020 revenue? 2021. 2021. It's that simple, guys. When did the sale take place? Now, that's the rule for what? Accrual accounting, right? So now I'm going to change it up a little bit and say, well, what happens? Hang on a second, guys. Xavier. All right. How are you? Okay. Okay. I'm in class right now, but I answered because it's you because this is the class that's waiting for the material. Okay. 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 Yeah. Okay. I'll do it right after class. All right. Thank you, sir. Okay. All right. Bye. Bye bye. Okay. So we got the link. So what they're going to do is they're going to email, a, I'm going to, they, I'm going to email a link to you. And then you click on that link and that's how you register for the Becker material. So we're almost there. I'd say by next week, we should have it. Okay. All right. Sorry about that. That wasn't why me calling. I got to talk to my bookie or anything like that. It was the answer because it was about Becker. Okay. All right. Good. So what happens? Um, let's say now that I tell you that the sale took place in 2020, but they don't collect the cash until 2021. And they don't collect it until January of 2021. Is that 2020 revenue or 2021 revenue? 2020. Still 2020 because what? This, that 60 day rule? The 60 day rule, although your question should have been, are you talking about government wide accrual or are you talking about governmental fund modified accrual? Okay. And if we're using the 60 day criteria that I can't seem to underline properly, I'm writing the line on top of it. If we're talking about 60 day, which you're always using here, it would be revenue at both levels, wouldn't it? Because what the 60 day only applies to modified accrual at the fund level, at the government wide level, it doesn't matter when they collect it. If the sale took place in 2020, it's 2020 revenue under the full accrual rules at the government wide level. At the fund level, you got to start looking to see when did they collect it. In the scenario I gave you was January, so it's revenue at both levels. They collect the, the sale took place in 2020. They collect the money in February of 2021, still within the 60 days. I think you know where I'm going. Sale took place in 2020, but they don't get around to collecting that money until April of 2021. Now we've got a difference. Now we've got a difference between what? Between modified accrual and full accrual under modified accrual that is not going to be revenue of 2020. That is revenue of 2021. Well, as under full accrual, that is what? That is 2020 revenue. Question. Okay, now I'm not gonna go through these other ones yet because we're gonna have examples of each one as we go along. So I'll kind of have to flip. I should probably place this slide several times in the deck, um, but I'll have to instead come back to this one as we go to the different categories. 
but let's, I think it's a more efficient presentation if we hold off on the other three rows here and just jump straight to our derived non-exchange, okay? And so what happens? Derived non-exchange, examples, income taxes, sales taxes, the underlying sale being the event that triggers the recognition, the filing of the income tax being the event that triggers the transaction. Okay, or I actually shouldn't say the filing because if they file late, it would still be money attributable to whatever year they're filing for is. So it's the earning in that year that constitutes the underlying event that, uh, that we derive our tax revenue from, okay? Okay, good. Again, for our derived, the revenue is recognized when the underlying transaction takes place as long as it meets what? The 60 day rule of thumb criteria that we'll always use in this class for modified accrual. For full accrual, we only deal with what? That first rule, when did the underlying transaction take place? So let's take a look at this example and uh, we have a sales tax rate of 6.25. And um, let's just go ahead and see how that's gonna look. And I know this is a little hard to read with some of the writing I have on it, but I will kind of call out what's going on here, okay? So we have what? We have this entity that has a fiscal year uh, that begins October 1st, okay? Fiscal year runs what? 12 months, but instead of running from December, from January to December, it'll run a 12 month period, say October 1st to September 30th. The federal government, for example, has an October 1st to September 30th fiscal year, okay? So the first quarter of the fiscal year, okay, is this October, November, December. So that's why it looks sloppy here because I squeezed the months in so that it makes it a little easier to follow. So October, November, December is the first quarter of this fiscal year, okay? And we have what? We have sales of 46,000. The tax rate is 6.25. So the sales tax is 2,875. And in this particular example, they do what? They collect the money in the uh, first month of the next quarter, okay? So I don't worry, that's why I put NA here. I don't care what they collected in the uh, first quarter of this year because that was attributable to what? The last quarter of the previous fiscal year, okay? So the money always comes in the next quarter, okay? So what happens? Well, when we look at our revenue recognition for accrual, we're going to count that money because the sale took place in this fiscal year, say um, 2020, whatever, 2021 in this example, let's say. Okay, then what? Then they have sales in the next year. And notice that they collect that money in that next quarter, the first month of the next quarter. But it doesn't matter because we're still in this fiscal, I guess we're going to assume fiscal 2021 20, here. And so that money for accrual recognition can be counted as revenue because that's when the sale took place. Here we have the sales that take place. Okay, we have this 13. 313, and we can go ahead and do what? We can take that revenue because that sale took place, okay? Now here, we start breaking out the months of that last quarter, okay? And notice that what? They collect all of it, but $200 uh, by October, and then there's $200 down here that for whatever reason, they didn't collect until December, okay? So what happens? Well, now you look and notice that for full accrual, we don't pay attention to when that money was collected because the sale took place during the last three months, during the last quarter of that fiscal year. Again, I guess we're saying 2021. July, August, September. So the sale took place. It doesn't matter that they didn't collect this full uh, third, uh, 1313 
uh, and they still had 200 that they hadn't collected yet, it doesn't matter because we're still, um, uh, the sale took place, I should say, still in the fiscal year, okay? Now, what happens? They get 1113 of that in October, and then they have to wait, what? The fiscal year ended in September, October, November. It's not until December, it's 90 days later that they get that remaining 200. Now, it doesn't matter. We still took the full 1313 as a revenue for full accrual, right? It's still that full 1313, even though that 200 had to wait. But for modified accrual, let's take a look and see what, what's happened. Well, here's the amounts that were all collected within the fiscal year, 5501. And then notice I added what? The 1113 that they collected in October because in this example, they're only 30 days outside the fiscal year. So I added that, that gave me 6614, okay? So when you take a look at the revenue for modified accrual, yeah, it's 6614. For full accrual, it's 6814 because they were able to take that 200 because the sale took place in the fiscal year. Modified accrual, we couldn't grab that last 200 and count it in this fiscal year because they fell outside of what we always use in this class 60 days. It was 90 days after. So when you look at how they adjust for this, the full 1313, when I say adjust to book the receivable at the end of the year, when you look at the full 1313, that's not gonna be collected until after September 30th, they set up a receivable for the full amount. They take the revenue for the full amount under accrual. For modified accrual, because we fell outside of that uh, 60 day criteria, we're down to 90 days, only 1113 can be revenue because they got that within the 60 days. The remaining amount of that receivable that fell outside of the 60 days is going to be a deferred inflow because we haven't met the time requirement specified by um, our agreement that we'll follow the rule of thumb. We'll follow the rule of thumb here of 60 days. Question. So if I'm sitting here and I'm making the journal entry that you saw on that previous page, and I'm on a different category of revenue here, guys, so don't get confused. It's, I just need a place to write. And I debit taxes receivable for what? 13, 13 it was, right? And remember, I'll assume the general fund. I record everything at the fund level. So I credited revenue for what? One, one, was it 11, 13? Yes. Thank you. And I credited deferred inflow, didn't I? Yep. For 200, okay. And I record everything at the fund level, right? But now I need to convert from my fund financial statements to my government wide, don't I? So what would be the converting entry that I would make on the worksheet? Would you back out the deferred inflow of 200 with a debit? Um, and then the re revenue of 1113, don't you have to back that out? No. Oh. It, the 1113 was revenue, oops, 1113 was revenue under both, right? Oh, yeah. That, right. that includes right. the 1113. The difference is the 200, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So... Sorry, is it a reclass? What do you want me to do? Huh? Is it a reclass? Are you it's going to conversion um, from from government from governmental fund to government wide? Yes. 
So okay. in order to do that, are you going to reclassify the deferred inflow as a deferred revenue? No. It would just be revenue under it's regular accrual. Revenue now, because again, I'm tr when I, okay. If this was my revenue uh, government wide, and this was my revenue um, governmental fund, at this point, right? Um, uh, well, it, it doesn't make sense if I have two. What the problem is, if I have two general ledgers, then this is then this is not necessary. Um, but the idea is, I only have one general ledger. I only have revenue, and I only have revenue that at this point I've reported. I've made the entry at the governmental fund level. So this is showing what one 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 three. This is showing um, deferred inflow. Of um, of 200. And if I want to turn this into government wide, I can't have this a government wide. I'm not taking any deferred inflow because this underlying sale took place. That was the only time requirement I had to meet. I wasn't dealing with the 60 days. And so I can take the full revenue. So I do that journal entry right now, right there. Now, when I report at government wide level, deferred inflow is zero, which it should be. And revenue is 2000, whatever it's supposed to be 313, right? Yeah, that makes sense. I had to convert from this essentially to this. I'm just saying, I'm showing you two different journal entries and I'm just trying to remind you that, you know, it, the, the, the result is different as to what you report as revenue. There's a $200 difference. I'm showing you two different journal entries, but the reality is you first do this, right? And then you do what? And then you adjust to by making this entry to create the government wide statements. You know, consolidated worksheet. We have eliminating entries and stuff in the middle. And then we have the pulled over consolidated statements, which you do in a consolidation. In government, not only do we have to eliminate by in elim eliminating inter fund transactions, but we also have to convert from the fund information where we first record to the government wide information. Okay, so you look at this example and it was all about this amount right here, wasn't it? I mean, all I had to track here was, well, how much fell outside of the 60 days and that amount for the fund level was a deferred inflow, the amount for the um, government wide um didn't consider that 200 i took that full revenue and that was not a deferred inflow question okay so two takeaways right here okay two takeaways right here time was the only thing we considered and by their time we meant when did the underlying transaction take place and time only has an additional requirement under modified accrual and that you have to make sure you collect that money in this class well as you 60 days okay all right good let's look at the impose non-exchange impose non-exchange the government tells you how much to send them derived you had to see okay you know how much did I, money did i make what did i buy you have to get the tax return in. With impose, the government tells you your house is worth X and you're going to have to send in 1.25% of that to us uh, every year or whatever, right? Okay, so that's called imposed. Okay, examples of imposed are property taxes. Okay, now for property tax, we sit here and we say that the government can take the revenue when use may first begin. Okay, so what happens? Governments will mail out their tax bill, say, in 2020, 
They'll levy that tax in 2020. But they'll say that that tax money that's being, the tax bills being levied out for in 2020, that's to cover 2021 activity. Governments do that. They send out the tax bill ahead of the year for which the activity they're going to use that money for. Well, since it says when use may begin and that money is for what, 2021 activities, that money has not met the time requirement at the time they send the tax bill out. So they will go ahead and they will debit tax receivable in 2020, credit deferred inflow in 2020, and for full accrual, as soon as the clock clicks over to what? 2021, now they're in the year when use may begin, and they will go ahead and debit deferred inflow and credit 2021 revenue because now they're in 2021. For modified accrual, same rules, but if some of the money that they mailed the tax bills out for in 2020 doesn't start getting collected until 2022, and we start falling outside of that 60 days, then at some point after 60 days, that money becomes what? Becomes 2022 money because you fell outside of the 60 days. Okay, now that's for property tax, things like property taxes. When you get to things like fines and penalties that are listed here, for fines and penalties now, it's when the government has a legally enforceable claim. Okay, and we'll start to, and I'll just underscore it. We'll talk more about that here in a second, uh, but I just want you to understand the government has a legally enforceable claim here. Okay, now what I want to do, because that example gets a little bit hard to follow when there's no visual in front of you. So what I want to do is go in, in Canvas. There is a, an example that is titled governmental accounting deferred inflow example. Okay. And that's basically what's on the screen right now. And I'm thinking, guys, can you tell me how do I get rid of these titles up here? Is there a way to just have the worksheet and not have all this nonsense up here? Yeah. Do you see the formula bar? Yeah. If you follow that bar all the way to the right side, there's a little up arrow um, just above it. So like uh, if you're looking, um, no, go down where you would actually type a formula in the bar. Oh, okay. Yeah. The, now see there's a down arrow, but above that, yeah, that's the one. Okay, cool. Thank you. I think that's a little better. We don't need that. Um, and, and I don't want you to say, well, why don't you just hit those pluses? Because then it takes everything off the screen at the same time. And I don't want that. Thank you. Sure. Okay. Okay, good. And you're going to have to do one of these guys. I apologize, but this it's, it is what it is. Okay. It's, I can't make it much bigger than that without, I need to get everything on the screen. Okay. So let's just take a look. You know, if we're in a classroom, this thing is going to be 10 by 10, whatever, you know, but um, let's just look at this here and kind of do your best to see what's up here. And we have the city of Hayward mails out tax bills for 2 million on November 7th, 2018. Look, I don't want to redo this thing every year to update the year. So just bear with the funny year here. 2018 to levy taxes for 2019 activities. Use of funds may begin in 2019 to finance 2019 activities. So they mail the bills out in this example. Really, are you really not going to let me draw on it? Okay, it's going to F with me, so I can't draw on it. Okay, so they mail the tax bills out here, and uh, they mail the tax bills out on November 7th. So they go ahead and they debit taxes receivable. Let me say something. I wonder if the culprit is, now how do I bring it back? Yeah, you have to um, click like a file button or home or insert or draw. Okay. I just want and to then, try something because I'm thinking maybe it's not letting me write on it because of that. Um, sure. It goes away unless you click the pin where that arrow used to be, if you want it to be back permanently. How do I bring it back permanently? Um, the same place where we clicked the arrow to, to push it away. 
there's a little uh -huh. like thumbtack. Oh yeah, yeah. Got it. Okay, thank you. Because I think it's better if I can draw on the thing. And I have a feeling, you know. Sometimes click, a, click draw with touch. Where's that? Uh, right next to the green marker. And now try. Okay, cool. Yeah, thank you. You guys are giving me a lesson in Excel here. Okay, thank you. Okay, so what happens? Because I think I do have to write on it. So we're talking about November 2017, right? And since it's November 2017, they mailed out the tax bills. They have to do something, okay? They can't have an accounting system where they don't know what bills they mailed out. So they go ahead and they debit taxes receivable, 2 million. And I'm assuming it's all collectible here. If there was an uncollectible amount, it would make this example just overly complicated. So I just wanna keep it assumed that there's gonna collect everything. And since we are not, and this is both the same government-wide and general fund, since we are not in 2020 yet, then we credit deferred inflow for that entire amount. And that's the same both at the government-wide and the fund level. We debit tax receivable, two million. We credit deferred inflow government-wide, two million. We credit deferred inflow in the general fund, two million. Okay, I'm assuming two general ledgers here, guys. I'm not gonna get into record everything at the fund and then convert the entry. Keep that in the back of your mind though, that that's what would happen. I'm assuming two GLs, a government-wide GL, a fund level GL, okay? All right, good. Then I come over and on 12-1, still in 2018, some people send in the money that I build them for. Now, why would a crazy person pay their taxes ahead of when they're due? So they don't Why would somebody pay their property taxes before they're due? Well, they don't forget or so they can deduct it in that year. Yeah, they're probably wanting to deduct, deduct it in 2018 of their tax payers. So this happens, right? Some people pay a little early, okay? So when the cash comes in and it's the same for the um, government wide and the fund level, the general fund, I'm assuming here, I go ahead and I debit the cash. And guys, I'm not going to tee up cash here. The cash account is not relevant for what we're talking about. I'm not going to tee up cash, but I am teeing up the receivable. And so I go ahead and I credit the receivable. I debit the cash. I didn't tee that up, but I credit the receivable. That gives me 1,900,000 left to go, right? Okay, good. I enter now into 2019, happy new year, right? 2019, January 1st, I enter into the new year. And now for the government wide, I can take all of that revenue because use may begin. I'm in 2019 and when I collect that money is of no consequence as to whether or not I'll take the revenue, okay? So I go ahead and I debit deferred inflow and I credit my government-wide revenue here, uh, two million. I got two million balance, and my balance at the government-wide level of deferred inflow is zero. Now, as a practical matter, since a government is sitting here and they're not knowing exactly when they're going to collect these uh, taxes that they levied in 2018 that are for 2019 activity. Could take them a while to get some of that. As a practical matter, they only take a revenue on amounts that they have collected. And at this point, yeah, I have collected what? 100,000, I collected that last year. And so what am I gonna do? Now I can go ahead and for that 100,000, debit the deferred inflow at the general fund, the fund level, and I can go ahead and credit the revenue at the fund level here for this 100,000, because I did collect that. I collected it last year, but I now have it, and I have it well within the 60 days. I'm still in the year. I'm still in 2019, okay? Okay, good. Then I continue on with this example in April 2019. Are we still in 2019? 
are we still, I don't mean actually, are we still in 20, I know it's not 2019 anymore. Are we still in 2019 in this example? We're still in 2019 in this example. We get a million more, we debit the cash, we credit the taxes receivable. Again, I'm not keeping track of the cash here. I credit the taxes receivable for a million. And now in the general fund, I can take an additional amount of revenue because I've collected now the money. I'm well within the 60 days. I'm still in 2019, right? So I go ahead and I debit the deferred inflow a million and I credit the revenue for a million dollars. Okay. Then what? Then I go. Are you going to let me go down a little bit here, uh, Excel? There we go. Then I come down a little bit more and I have some more money that gets collected in uh, September. I'm still in 2019. This is a calendar year end. The year is not going to end until December 31st. So I go ahead and I do what? I debit the cash. I credit the taxes receivable. Okay, I'm not keeping track of cash. So there's my credit to my taxes receivable. Still got 100,000 to go. And since I'm still in 2019 in this example, I can go ahead and debit the deferred inflow. Okay, for the additional um, 800,000, where's my deferred inflow? Okay, I can debit my deferred inflow for that 800,000 and I can go ahead and credit my revenue for 800,000, okay? Okay, good, now what? Now I come down a little bit more Okay, and I in 2020 now, and I collect 75,000. Am I within 60 days of 2020? That's the easiest question I've asked you all day. Am I within 60 days of 2019? I should say that's why you didn't answer it. Yes. Yes. I'm still within 60 days of 2019, John. Good. So I go ahead and I collect that cash. I debit the cash, 75,000. I credit the receivable, 75,000. I love when Excel decides to be an idiot with me. Okay, so I debit the receivable. I got 25,000 left, right, to collect. And now I can debit the deferred inflow, 75,000, got 25,000 left to go. And I can take that as 2019 revenue for my fund level because I'm still sitting here in what, within 60 days. I'm in 2020 now, but I'm with 60 days of 2019. So I can go ahead and take that, okay? Then what? Then I think you know what's happening, going to happen for that last 25,000. My scripts are very predictable here. Then what happens? 320, am I 60 days um, within 2019 now on 320, 2020? No. No, I've fallen outside the 60 days. So what happens? Well, I still got to debit the cash and credit the receivable. And you know, this example is a little unrealistic because by now they probably would have mailed out more tax bills to cover activity in 2020 and whatnot. And so I'm just assuming, you know, the receivable is only related to this one example, but we've collected everything now, right? And what happens? I can go ahead and I can now debit the deferred inflow for that last 25,000. I'll show it to you down here in general journal form. I can go ahead right here, down at the bottom please, and debit the deferred inflow 25,000. And now I credit revenue, but notice guys, I don't credit the 2019 revenue. I credit what? 
by now I would have opened the 2020 revenue ledger. I record that in my 2020 revenue ledger. And as I showed you already, I would have debited the deferred inflow. Deferred inflow, at least for this transaction now, is zero, for this example is zero. And I now take that revenue, but it's 2020 revenue. So that's a hell of a long way to go to say that for what? Property taxes, right? What do we do? If it says that the use may begin in, and I'm just gonna use year one, year two stuff. If they say that the use may begin in year two, but I mail the bills in year one, in year one, that's deferred inflow because I haven't met the time requirement because I'm not in year two yet, right? Then what happens? Government wide, as soon as I get into year two, I take that all of deferred all out of deferred inflow and put it all into revenue. For my fund financial statements, I'm going to sit there and I'm going to what? Cautiously watch to see when I have collected that money. And when I collect that money, then I'll take it out of deferred inflow and put it into revenue just in case some amount like this 25,000 falls outside of the uh, 60 days of year two. Now it could be what? Into year three. And um, I'm now beyond the 60 days. That's going to be revenue of year three. So this example would have, you know, the transaction going across three years, essentially. Okay. Question. Are you sure? Um, so on the last example, we had that, 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 uh, I don't want to say, is it, was it a consolidation entry of that $200? Yeah. Or, um, but do we have to do something with that $25,000 at the end of the year? That's in the fund level deferred. Yeah. Inflow. Yeah. So what you would be having is just look at the ledger, just look at the, um, look at the, um, look at the, um, general funds revenue ledger and deferred inflow at, um, you know, this is sitting there with 25,000 and that's sitting there, um, you know, well, here's what's happening because it gets a little bit confusing because even though the year ends December 31st and that last 75,000, you're looking and saying, well, that last 75,000 um, did that, not that last 75,000, but that 75,000 didn't get collected until January. And we're now outside of the year, yet we're issuing the financial statements at December 31st. But this government that wouldn't get along to around to issuing the financial statements probably till March. So even though we're March 2020, by now we know, and we're going to issue the statements in March 2020, by now we know what amounts have fallen outside of the 60 days. So we would say, well, okay, if that's the case, then, and we're trying to now turn them into the government-wide statements at the government-wide level, okay, the answer is that the uh, deferred inflow should be zero, shouldn't it? So, but on my, at my fund level, deferred inflow right now is showing that 25,000, even though I probably by then already collected it, but I'm trying to represent what was happening in December 31st. So I would go ahead and debit the, the, uh, cons the uh, consolidating slash converting journal entry that you're asking me about. I would debit the deferred inflow 25,000 and credit. And if you look, my revenue for 2019 is showing 1,975, but I know that my revenue at the government wide level 
It's so annoying that it's not scrolling for me. At the government wide level, I know that my revenue, where'd it go? My government wide revenue is supposed to be what? 2 million. So I go ahead and I would credit revenue for 25,000, right? Yeah, okay, so it's essentially the exact same thing as the $200. Different numbers, but yeah, yeah. of what okay. we said before, yeah. Yes, so that's okay. a long way of answering your question, but I think it's worth noting because that can get confusing that will help. Wait a minute, John, we're not knowing about that 25,000 until March and we're preparing the financial statements at 1231, 2019, but because there's a lag between the end of the year and the time that they actually issue the statements, um, the government would, you know, pretty much know by then what it had actually collected within the 60 days. You say, well, what if they don't? Well, then they should, what if they had to issue the financial statements in, in June, by January 30th, let's say. They, I don't know any government that is that efficient that gets them out that quickly. But if that was the case, then they would have to estimate what they think they will collect within the 60 days and make this entry. Okay. Yep. Question. All right, here's what you need to do because I'm not going to keep going here with stuff for five minutes. Um, what you need to do is you need to get this example and walk yourself back through it. If you get stuck and you're like, huh, I can't do it. What's going on here? I don't understand. You got the video. Okay, but you've got to do that. That's your homework over spring break. The other homework that you're going to get over spring break is going to be um, to sign up for the Becker material. I'm going to get you that link here. If not today, first thing tomorrow. Well, actually, I got to double check. He wanted me to double check to make sure it's working before I send it to you guys. So I'll do that. Assuming it's working, I'll give it to you sometime tomorrow and you want to sign up to get that material and not everybody has to click on the link if you don't want it then you don't have to do it some of you in email they said you don't need it and so for you guys you wouldn't click on it for the people that want it i don't have to do it you do it you go and re register to get the stuff okay so you'll have that and you may want to start looking at uh chapters um chapter nine at this point i think would be helpful for you to start to look at that um, because that can give you some supplemental reading. But most important thing is that you've digested this example and the sales tax one because with our time limitations now, I'm going to pretty much, I'm not going to go back over this. I'm going to hit the ground running now talking about the next category of non-exchange, which is government mandated. So make sure you're comfortable with this because I'm not going back over it next time. Okay. Question. So are you going to post this? Is this example on Canvas already? Or are you going to post it? This file's on Canvas. OK. Not marked up the way I just did. It's got the highlighting, this green and yellow highlighting, but not the red. But gotcha. you, don't, you don't need that. You should be able to follow it step by step. If you get stuck, you, know, huh? Huh? you got a video, right? And you can look at the video. Of course, I'll be in my office hour, by the way, next week on Wednesday. If you need me for something, you can come through, even though it's on the break. Um, and then I'll see you not next Tuesday, but the Tuesday after. And we're going to roll into this because we we got to get chapter four done for sure next week. Okay, sounds good. All right, guys. Questions? Hi. No? Okay, guys. Have a good night. I will see you not next week, but the week after. Have a good break, okay? Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Have a nice Bye. spring break. Bye-bye. Bye, guys.